Buildings in the European Union are responsible for 40% of the European energy demand, and most of this demand is energy inefficient. Buildings are also responsible for 36% of CO2 emissions. The European Union established with the Energy Performance of Building Directive a legislative framework to ensure that the efficiency of these buildings is improved. But more recently, the European institutions are working on a revision of this uh, framework directive to ensure that this aspect is further strengthened, but also the objective is enlarged to also make sure that buildings are flexible and active in the way that they are in interacting with uh, the system that they are uh, integrating, inter interacting and part of. That's an important feature, this demand-side flexibility of buildings uh, that needs to be further strengthened. I'm very happy to have uh, in this Smart Energy Talk uh, the uh, actual rapporteur of the position of the European Parliament, uh, Chiaran Kaff, a member of the European Parliament from Ireland and the key representative of uh, the European Green Party, who is the rapporteur of the position of the European Parliament. And with him, today we are going to indeed address some of the key elements of this revision and in particular uh, better understanding the position of the European Parliament. So, Thanks a lot, Karen. It's good to be with you. Very good, very good. So, indeed, let's start with uh, this uh, understanding of better understanding of how the European Parliament is uh, strengthening the position of the European Commission on these key aspects of transforming buildings into flexible and interactive elements in the power system. Well, we don't have time to lose, uh, and we really need to accelerate our action on climate. And this will create jobs as well. But one important thing within the Parliament's position is that flexibility and energy efficiency are key. Uh, and in particular, we've, uh, we've introduced a definition of system efficiency. And I think that will make it easier to understand how buildings can really contribute uh, to tackling emissions, but also to allow flexibility in what they do. Because when you think about it, Buildings are really like a giant battery. You can charge them up, you can heat them, you can cool them at particular times, and they help um, modulate and work with renewables. Uh, so if we think of uh, flexible uh, energy use, buildings are the perfect receptacle for that, and they can really adapt to the changing inputs. And that, I think, will deliver really uh, a, a gentle revolution uh, on tackling climate. And that's, and that's an extremely important point, and uh, it fits perfectly with the new ambition, the zero emission target objective uh, to really help decarbonize the entire building stock in 2030. And this flexible uh, capability of buildings uh, is very important. How has the Parliament addressed this, uh, this new objective? Well, when we talk about zero emission buildings, they don't have to be completely relying on energy internally. They can take uh, very efficient energy from the grid. They can take renewables uh, from district heating systems. Uh, they can take energy from community uh, energy schemes. So we're absolutely uh, allowing uh, sufficient flexibility, we believe, uh, in how we define this. Uh, but it is a step forward. Uh, it's an improvement on the near zero emission buildings in the current law. Uh, so I think we are being more ambitious and we are allowing flexibility once again to be central to delivery uh, of, of uh, our climate goals. Exactly. You stress indeed a very important aspect that uh, buildings should be enabled to have an on-site renewable generation, but should be also indeed able to flexibly consume the renewable from the systems. On the first aspect, the European Commission last year during the crisis came up with uh, an additional element uh, in the context of the Repower EU uh, um, proposals to actually foster uh, the deployment of solar rooftop um, uh, on buildings. We believe that uh, solar PVs are extremely important, in particular in buildings with uh, high energy loads uh, in yeah. view of indeed an increased electrification because of the electrification of heating and transport systems, so there should be a, a specific priority needs for these kind of buildings. What's, what's your views on that? Yeah, well, look, solar rooftops are an obvious uh, thing that we can promote. And if you get a child to draw a greenhouse, they'll put solar panels 
uh, on the roof. And of course, solar panels have a role to play, uh, particularly with dealing with uh, providing energy. Uh, it's a sunny day here in Brussels in uh, February or March, and, and, and it helps, uh, but also um, uh, to help with the cooling of, of large buildings uh, in the south uh, at particular times. But the Repower EU, it's not just about rooftop solar. It's about heat pumps, uh, but it's also about demand side flexibility. So working out when energy can be taken uh, from the grid, how it can be stored, how it can be used within the system. And then within buildings, uh, perhaps reducing the heating load on rooms where there's nobody present. Uh, so smart technologies, they're changing everything. And the, re the Repower EU plan is great, but it goes way beyond simply putting on solar panels. It's all about a change in thinking in how buildings operate and how they demand, not just to the user's needs, but also to what energy can be provided from elsewhere. Very good. So indeed, it's a multitude of assets. And uh, electric vehicles, which will increase in number and in shares because of this electrification of the transport sectors, will provide additional flexible resources if the charging is smart or bidirectional. In the EPBD, there are some uh, key uh, provisions on that because indeed, most of the time, uh, charging of electric vehicles will take place in buildings, in our homes or in our offices. How has this been addressed in this uh, uh, revision? Well, we are pushing for more ambition in terms of charging points, but also in terms of the ductwork. Uh, even if you can't afford to put in the full charging mechanism, you can put in the ducts. And when, when the, the time comes uh, to increase the charging points, it's much cheaper to do it if the ducts are there. It's also important to realize that electric vehicles are generally parked for 20, 22 hours of the day. Um, and if we opt for bi-directional charging, those vehicles can help back up the grid. And this is a game changer, because if we look ahead three years, five years, we'll have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of electric vehicles sitting there for most of the time. And one of the real challenges with renewables is these spikes in power use. But if we can use those electric vehicles to dampen down the spikes and to give power back to the grid when it's needed most, then we really have a win-win uh, solution. So yes, um, electric charging is about putting in the plugs, putting in the charging points, but it's also about this symbiotic relationship between the building, people's mobility needs, and making sure that smart solutions make this all much more flexible and user-friendly as well as grid-friendly. And good. And efficient for the entire energy system, as you were mentioning at the very beginning of this uh, conversation. Um, another important aspect of this revision uh, is the improvement of uh, certificates uh, like the Energy Performance Certificate or the Smart Trading Certificate smart readiness indicator for buildings, and then there are some references also on new indicators like uh, the renovation passport or the digital building logbook. These are all very important tools, uh, um, but we believe that they need to be strengthened in order to actually provide information to occupants, but also market players and eventually also system operators on the actual performance of uh, um, buildings. What's uh, your uh, take on that? I think that's a real opportunity. And particularly as we roll out smart meters around Europe, we have the possibility for sending information back, at the, back to the grid, back to the utility providers. Now, this obviously has to be GDPR compliant. It has to protect the privacy of householders. But if we do this right, it'll give real-time information on the actual energy demands. And we'll learn from this. So uh, we'll be able to come back and do it even better as as the years go by. But absolutely, I mean, the minimum energy performance standards, the MEPS or the ABCD, that is at the heart of this directive. But moving beyond that to the smart indicators, this allows us to give a much more sophisticated set of data from what's actually happening in that building. And if we can use this data, I think it will save people money on their bills and it will make the grid more resilient as well.
Very good. And it will be actually the result of the interlinkages between the digital and game tra transition. So we can rely on this data from uh, behind the meters to provide more information to actually benefit from these flexibility aspects. And linking the actual performance uh, quantification of a building to financing schemes will be ideal, so that public resources or any type of investment will be directly related to a proven performance improvement. Yeah. That's uh, the ideal way of uh, allocating resources. I think that's crucial. Uh, and I think uh, banks and financial institutions, they want clear information on the rate of return. Because, you know, the renovation can be the price of a new car. It's a lot of money. And for households where you're strapped for cash, you want to give the right financial assistance. Uh, certainly, if we want to have a just transition, we need to help people who are struggling to pay the bills. And this winter, lots of people were struggling and turning down the heating, turning off the lights. Uh, but I think there's a real opportunity here uh, to link in the data to the rate of return. And the financial institutions, the European Central Bank, they've said they want this law uh, to be enacted. The European Investment Bank says that they are becoming a climate bank. And as you said in your introduction, over one third of the emissions in Europe are coming from buildings. And if we can provide the right financial package to somebody who's on a decent income, to somebody who's on a low income, uh, to help those who are in greatest need, this to me, is about tackling energy poverty. It's about helping people who are struggling and giving them a financial package that is absolutely attuned to their needs. Good, very good. So you had uh, several discussion within this house, uh, within the European Parliament. You are approaching uh, the parliamentary uh, final uh, plenary vote, uh, but then uh, the other steps will be indeed the discussion with the Council. How are you preparing for these final steps and when do you think a final deal will, a final deal will be reached so that the uh, uh, EPBD will be then open for implementation? Yeah, well, we're looking at uh, concluding the file during the Swedish presidency. In other words, by the end of the first half of this year, by the end of June, uh, we're hoping uh, that we get a final agreement at a trialogue where Council, uh, Commission and Parliament strike a deal. Uh, I think there are obviously concerns in some countries in Central Europe. There is a very real concern that um, we're moving to different energy sources. And we need to make sure that people receive the support that they need on this. Some countries want greater ambition, but obviously some people are concerned about the cost because it is real money. So I think, what am I doing? I'm trying to reach out and listen to what the concerns are coming from the 27 member states. Uh, I'm absolutely open to meeting uh, with the different country representatives, listening to their concerns. And I think, I think we can address them uh, and really... From my time in politics, I know a huge amount of achieving success is about listening to the very real concerns that people can have. I'm ambitious. I want to accelerate action. I want to go far. But I absolutely understand the need to talk to people on the left, on the right, uh, and to talk to countries, north, south, east and west, and listen to um, the issues that they raise. Because the buildings are different in different parts of Europe. Even the energy performance uh, uh, grids that they use are quite different. We want to align these, not completely, but move towards that. Uh, and we want to ensure that the money uh, is there. We need new skills. We need new money. Uh, and we need to bring people on this journey with us. But I do think there is support. Uh, and I am optimistic that we can strike a final deal and move into implementing this law by the end, uh, certainly by the second half of this year. Thanks a lot, Kieran, for uh, your work, for your ambition, and for your continuous efforts to find a deal on the energy performance of building directed revision, which is going to be a major piece of uh, legislation for consumers, for citizens, but also for the clean, uh, cost-effective transitions towards climate neutrality objective, with demand accessibility as a key aspect of this renovation of the European building stocks.